Well, the title of my message is found there in Matthew 10, verse 28. And uh, the title of my message, well, it's not, it's not found in there, but those are the verses that I have for the message. The title of the message is actually Health Eternal. The title of the message or the sermon this afternoon is uh, Health Eternal. And if you turn there to Matthew 10, verse 28, it starts and it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them uh, shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your hair, hair, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. And the title of my message today is Health Eternal because, you know, the purpose of the local church is to address the local congregation. And even though all the messages that I preach uh, are meant for that, Sometimes, you know, the messages or the doctrines are just universal or, 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 or not generic, but they're doctrines that can be applied in any church. So, for example, if, you know, if I'm preaching on the reprobate doctrine, whether this church is the one listening or, you know, because we record these, uh, these uh, sermons, uh, another individual somewhere across the world is listening to it, it's going to ring true or it's going to make sense. And, but there's times when I think, you know, you know, I'm going to record this, and hopefully it helps somebody out there that watches it, but it's not meant for those individuals. It's meant for this local church. You know, in the last couple of weeks and months, we have several church members who, are be going, who will be going through some, uh, you know, surgery procedures and medical procedures, and it's just a good reminder of what the Bible tells us about health. And, you know, the biggest thing that we have to understand before I even get into the, the, the points of the message is that uh, the problem with uh, society as a whole with the problem with being birthed into this world is that we're already born sick we're born with uh, the sickness of sin it's a sin nature we're born you know with the ability to one day learn as, as we mimic others as children to start to commit sin you know I mean your your children are not at the age of accountability but you start to see the pattern and the pattern doesn't move towards perfection, but it starts moving towards corruption and depravity, it's up to the parents to correct that. You know, it's it, the first time your child lies, it's not to, to something to, that's cute, it's a symptom of the ultimate, like, sickness of the ultimate disease, which is, you know, death. And then on top of that, as they get older, you have to explain that there's an eternal death. It's not just the death of the physical body, but it's also the spiritual death. And we see this uh, here and even though these verses are, are speaking, you know, this is when Jesus sends out the disciples and he's given them great power. You know, we see here that uh, really the verse that really stands out to me it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And you know, this morning we were talking about uh, in, uh, in our Sunday school, we were talking about how, how to deal with anxiety and. Uh, the verses that they were using were talking about it, you know, just that it's not a light affliction and that we're going to be persecuted and that we're going to have challenges and that if we lose our life, and even here in Matthew, if we lose our life, we'll gain it, you know, just different things like that. And the, the, I guess the, the very first thing before I even get into anything is that just we, we have this eternal disease. And so before we even address any of, of life's health issues, anything that we need to do with life, the first thing we need to do is address the disease of the soul. You know, I mean, if you, if you turn your Bibles, turn your Bibles over to Hebrews 12, and I'll quickly read for you Luke 5.30 as you're turning over Hebrews 12. But the Bible says there <clears throat> in Luke 5.30, it says, But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? They're talking about Jesus. And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so we see here a strong admonition against the Pharisees. And I, and I think there's a twofold application. Obviously, Jesus came to heal the souls of men and women. He came and he died on the cross, paying our sins for that ultimate disease, the, the poison that runs through our blood 
from the time of Adam's transgression until we redeemed and were cleansed in his blood and his purified blood. But the other thing he's saying here is, look, you guys are too pious. You, you don't you don't think you have a disease. And and here he's not talking about the physical disease. Uh, I think yeah, here he's talking about the spiritual disease. You know, because Jesus obviously we know from scripture and I, and I could have just sat there and given you scores of scripture after scripture after scripture of where he heals the sick and he, you know, raises Lazarus from the dead and he uh, gives sight to the blind and, you know, uh, people touch his garment and they get healed. I mean, it's just, he, that's what he did. But that was just a byproduct of the ultimate healing, which is the healing of the soul. And un, ultimately what, what happens is in life, we're all going to have, illness we're going to have sickness we're going to have pain but when we solve the sickness of the soul then it's all just secondary and then we can face it a much better way you know if you if you're there in hebrews 12 verse 1 so the first thing that we have to understand is that god is the author of our life he's the author of our, our eternal life and so the very first thing the thing that we should focus on is we should focus on praising god and we should focus on whatever his will is for our life because unfortunately, we are going to have to face medical procedures or we're going to have to face pains and aches and we're going to have to face heart lo uh, heartache and loss. Uh, and, and at times, people pray. And, you know, the prayer is always, well, we're praying for so-and-so, that God provides healing, that God provides so-and-so. And I'm always a little tentative to do that. Now, it's not that I don't want people to get healed, but it might, I think the more appropriate prayer is that, we do, that God do his will. Because we don't know what God's will is for people's life. And I think that you're setting yourself up for disappointment if you ask God, Lord, please heal somebody. And then that person doesn't get healed and you feel like God didn't answer your prayer. And, and the challenge is if you, you, you ask God, just like the model prayer, that we do things after his will, then God will then heal you. I mean, we'll do things. And if, he, if a person gets healed, then we, we, we accept it for it's his will. And if a person doesn't get healed, then we accept it because it's not uh, his will. And right there, the very first point of the message is uh, there in uh, Hebrews 12, uh, verse 1. And we see that God is the author of our eternal life. And so verse, verse 1 there of Hebrews 12 says, Wherefore, seeing we are also come past about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily, so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I love that, that part right there. For the joy, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He did that joyfully, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so we see here that God is, you know, if he's the author and finisher of our faith, then that's the ultimate the ultimate goal. I mean, why do we go soul winning? Why do we, uh, you know, as Pastor Cobb alluded to this morning, why do we come to church? Because, you know, it's all about his glory and, and for his honor. And so we want things, we want blessings on, on people's lives. We want them to be well. We want them to come out of surgeries well. We want to be healed from their sicknesses. But if we've healed the soul, then ultimately whatever happens, uh, we know that it is his will and he's doing it for his glory. You know, so the first thing is God is the author of eternal life. Turn over to Exodus 12. Exodus 12 is what I'm going to do is just give you a couple examples. And, and uh, hopefully we can tie them together where just God removes and, he, and God adds. You know, we're talking about health eternal today. And, and, and really the health that we're looking for is the eternal health of the soul. And, and you know, if you're, there, if you're there, turn to Exodus 12. And we're going to be there in Exodus 12 and we're going to be there in verse 29. The first example we're going to see is we see that God is the one who brings down the, uh, the judgment, the physical judgment unto death on, on uh, Egypt because of Pharaoh's stiff neck. Uh, you know, he was hard-headed and stiff neck. And we see there in Exodus 12, verse 29, it says, And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, and he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in e Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses 
and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among you people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as ye have said, and be gone and bless me also. And, you know, obviously we see this. This is, uh, at this point, basically Pharaoh is reprobate and he's gone through the ten plagues. And, it's, and instead of getting better, he's gotten worse. Every time the plague comes, it, his heart is hardened even more. And every time the plague comes, and that's really a, a society's issue. You know, they, they get angry at God, but the reality is that they're just angry at themselves because ultimately when you hate God, you hate yourself. You know, and, and so can you imagine these people, you know, they're praying to their gods and they're saying, please heal us, let these plagues, and they're losing that battle because ultimately who, who's the one who adds or removes anything? It's God. You know, God's the one who removed the death, I mean the soul from those individuals. God's the one who removed that last breath from them. God's the one who takes it away. He's the creator. He's the ultimate life giver. You know, let, uh, go to Job 1. Go to Job 1. We're going to look at Job. We see both examples. You know, because people think that, that they can control it. And, and, and going back to that, that verse, the reason I'm covering this is because you see that in Matthew 10, 28. It says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, I mean... We were talking about it earlier, and it was appropriate, even though that I didn't know that that's what we we're going to cover this morning, that uh, the, the messages that we're covering is that God's the one who ultimately controls everything, and it's the soul that we're concerned about, you know, because God can add or remove anything in your life. He, he removes it, and here in, in Job, we see what, that he's going to remove certain things from Job's life. You know, and the people looking from the outside, if you read the entire 42 chapters, Everybody that looks at Job thinks Job's the one in the wrong. And what they don't realize is that God's working a, a work that's greater than anything that we could have ever imagined. Because to this day, we're still using Job as the example of what it is to suffer through hardship, to see the blessings of God in our, in our life. You know, to see what God can do in our life if we're just faithful to him. You know, there in Job 1, verse 6, I mean, Job's really tried, right? It says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. In it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job, doth Job fear God for naught? Has thou made, has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hand and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in my power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So we see here, when we, and I love the Job's reaction to this in the next 42 chapters because it's true to what we just read. Fear not him who can take your body, but he who can take your body and soul. You know, I mean, Job was not unhappy. He praised the Lord. Now, did he suffer? Absolutely. I mean, you just read the 42 chapters, and, and there's times where Job just, he's like, you know, it had been better for me to just not been born. It had been better for me to just die. You know, from, from dust I came, let me go back. And what we, what we see here is that God's the one who pointed him out. Satan didn't do anything. I mean, as, as a matter of fact, if you read this in its context, you see how weak Satan is. So sometimes, you know, the, the, the wrong mentality, and I've been guilty of this. My, my wife's really good about, you know, correcting that in me. Something will go wrong in our life, uh, maybe health or, you know, uh, We'll, we'll, uh, some, something will happen, and then a few days after you start to feel sick, and I'm like, see, that's God just punishing me for... But it's not for us to play that game, because the Bible says His ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So we don't know why God has uh, allowed certain things in our life. Not all the time. We do know that it's for the trying of the soul, and it's for His benefit, but we don't know the ultimate end goal, right? I mean, I, I didn't know when we were struggling... Uh, at the previous church we were attending, that the goal was to show up here at uh, Spring Crest and serve under Pastor Cobb and then one day get ordained. That, that was a, the furthest thing from my mind when, when that happened. 
you know, and uh, I didn't know that we'd ever have a soul winning program. And I didn't know that, you know, I'd built such strong relationships with the people that go soul winning with. It, it, you know, I didn't know all that in the, during the tough times and the tribulation and just looking for the right place to land. And so also when it comes to health, we just don't know why we're feeling certain ways. I mean, Paul had that thorn in his flesh and God didn't remove it. As a matter of fact, he said, you know, it's going to stay there and remain there. When you're weak, I'm, uh, then you're strong. Here, Job, I mean, Job's oblivious to this conversation. I mean, Job just, he's doing his business. He's praising the Lord. He's uh, putting the sacrifices for his kids because basically they're just rebellious children. And then what happens? God's like, look, have you considered my son Job? You know, uh, what did he say? The Lord, has thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and sheareth evil. So, I mean, we see that God's the one who's removing certain things from Job's life, but it's for the trying of his spirit, but it's also for, for a greater purpose. To this day, uh, you know, we're still talking about Job. Then go to 2 Kings. Go to 2 Kings uh, 5, verse 1. Go to 2 Kings. And then we're, we're going to tie some of these stories together. Not all of them, but, but some of them. Uh, but 2 Kings uh, 5, we see there in um, verse 1, it says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord hath given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Right? And, uh, and Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go. And wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, that's why I was like, I changed the color. I, I'm setting this up in my, my notes. I, uh, so color coding is good, but sometimes it can be bad because then you, you miss. The, the purpose here is 2 Kings 5, verse 1, is talking about Naaman. And Naaman is the guy who has leper. And then I didn't want to go into all the verses just because for the sake of time. But basically... He wants healing from his leprosy, or at least the, the, the mistress, the, the servant wants it. And they basic, and the king sends him over to Elijah, or Elijah says, have him come this way. And then in verse 10, we see, and Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. So we see that Elijah is about to do some great work. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, behold, I thought... He will surely come out of me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farfra, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he said to thee, Wash and be clean. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And so we see that God removed, what he removed there was Naaman's pride. You know, sometimes that's what we, we, we're expecting, right? We get these long, lengthy prayers, you know. And, and I mean, I'm honestly, I'm praying not only for Brother James, but Brother Bobby and brother Tommy, but my prayer is that God do his will in, in those men. You know, it's not that God would heal brother Tommy or I mean Bobby so that he has new knees and he can run marathons. I, you know, I don't know what, what, what that, uh, plus that sounds almost like a foolish prayer, but I don't know what the purpose is, but if you're going into things expecting that kind of result, then you're not going to get that result. You're going to be angry. I mean, name is so angry because he's heard of God and he expects this this great, like, I don't know, I guess, I mean, he said it there, right? He said, but, but Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord as God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. He was like expecting this big spectacle. You know what I mean? I was watching, I don't know, uh, somebody was making fun of one of these uh, uh, fake healers. And so there's just this little clip. And this guy was serious, and he's, uh, I forget his name, but he's been on, like, the TV channels. And they're showing him throughout the stages of his career, I guess, when he was young and now older and everything. And he's calling people out. He's like, look, you're not going to get healed unless you send $1,000 and you put your faith. And, you know, he's calling. And it's basically this, this mentality that you have to do something great and God, ask God greatly and God will provide greatly. 
What God wants you to do is pray fervently for his will, and then he will do the great work. And, and he does the great work where you least expect it. I mean, I think that here, and by the way, this is just my opinion, but Naaman, because I've been guilty of this, where you know that somebody told you something would happen, you're not quite sure you believe it, but enough curiosity in you helps you follow through only to prove yourself wrong and have to swallow your pride. I, I don't know if that's ever happened to you where somebody says, you know, if you just, if you just go down there and, and, and you do this and this and that, you're going to get this result. And you're like, I don't think this guy knows what he's talking about. You know, I, I don't really. Well, I, you know, a great example was I remember when I was in sales, the hardest thing. Well, I'm still in sales, but when I was like, as, I wanted to be my career, I hated scripts because they sounded so corny. And I remember the trainers would get up and say, if you just do the script, if you just follow everything that's in here, it's going to work. And you're like, that's not going to work. So then the very first thing you do is you pick up the phone and, and you do your own thing and you fail. And then you do your own thing and you fail. And then you, you finally like, you swallow your pride. You're curious enough to do it. And you deliver this thing like the worst you could ever have delivered this, this script. Because you're just in a bad mood. You didn't practice it. You didn't do anything. You're like, hello, you know, may I speak with so and so? And then you use the corny line like, it, you know, I'd love to set an appointment, but It'd be like giving your haircut over the phone. It'd take twice as long and it never come out right. You feel like an idiot saying it. All of a sudden, you get the appointment and then you realize that you know, these things do work. And that's kind of what God you know, is doing here in Naaman's life. He's like, Naaman, this is the, this is the formula. And Naaman's like, no, I thought this was the formula. And I don't know if you've ever had conversations with people where they expected, you know, they're like, well, I think or I thought or what I think God would do in this situation, or I don't think Jesus would act like this, or I don't think God really wants this result for people, or there's no way that God would ever do that to them, and they don't read the Bible, and they don't follow the instructions that God has given them. I mean, Saul's guilty of that through and through, and all this, if you just read Samuel and you see King Saul, God says, do one, two, three, and Saul always goes and he does like one, and like two and a half, and he never completes three. And then he's, he's angry because the results aren't the ones that he's getting. And I think when it comes to our health, we're the same way. You know, you hear all these health and wealth preachers or you turn on the TV and they're saying, hey, coffee's in. Drink coffee because it's really good for your health. And then 10 years later, coffee's bad. Coffee's going to kill you. Coffee has cancer. And then Coke kills you. Look, look what it does to the toilet. And then drink a Coke every once in a while. I mean, everybody's giving you the opinions, but what is God saying? Look, ultimately, he's the, the giver and the taker away of life. Ultimately, that's what's going to happen, and I'd love for everybody to be healed every time they get sick, but the reality is there's going to be a point. There's going to be that one final time where they're not going to get sick. I mean, where they're not going to get recovered, where they're not going to get better, but the ultimate goal is if, they, if that soul's taken care of, then they're healed for all eternity. That poison's out of their system. They're no longer going to have to deal with the sin of life, the, 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 the sin nature, and what, but the, what they have is that eternity in Christ. But if we do it in the right context, if, these, if, if individuals are working, if these guys that are going to go in for these uh, treatments, and not just them, but everybody that, that's in church that has to do with anything, if we're doing it for God's purpose, then not only are we going to maybe get better, but the people around us will then uh, reap those rewards, right? One of the things that I enjoy about you know, going out with Brother James is I know he's struggling, and I know he's sick, but he, he, has a, uh, uh, he cares for the souls of men and women. He's going out there, and he, he'd rather do that than spend all his time wallowing about how bad he feels. Well, that's great. That's an encouragement to me because, you know, sometimes I act like a little baby, and I just feel bad about, I don't know, my toe hurts, and I still now I go out because Brother James makes me look bad. But God's the one that removes things in your life. Now, he, he can remove them for bad, and I should give you an example. You know, Pharaoh, he hurt in his heart. He removed people's lives from him, the firstborn. But with Job, he removed all his children, all his cattle, his hell, you know, just about everything except his wife, and then his friends, only to leave them around so that they could just point fingers at Job and say, you, you don't know what you're talking about. What kind of sin did you do? You know, man, something's wrong with you. Are you sure you didn't eat the right food? Are you sure that you just didn't, you know, maybe you ate that processed food and that's why you got boils? Did you ever meet those uppity people? who, you know, they, they eat perfect so that, you know, they're supposedly never sick and then all they do is point fingers at how bad you, your diet is and that's why probably you have this and that. God's the one who's, who's going to give you all that, good or bad. I mean, I'm not saying don't be healthy, 
But I'm just saying that people have been around for thousands of years, and people have had cancer for thousands of years, and people have not had cancer for thousands of years, and, and people take care of themselves and leave. I mean, I have an uncle who's in his late 80s who's never been to the doctor. And by the way, he's not led a healthy life. I'm not going to, you know, he's a guy that drinks and just does I mean, but maybe that, you know, the Bible says that don't look at that, because I know he's not saved, and think that that's a good thing because maybe that's his reward. And that's not a good reward to have. Because that means that his eternal uh, place might be a different place. And then you see people who, you know, I hear, I've heard stories of pastors who just, their, their wives are sick and they have to retire early and they just have all this burden. But they've done great works for the Lord. We just don't know. So our, our prayer should always be to do God's will. And then go to 2 Kings 20. Go to 2 Kings and just keep your finger there in Job. We're going to be at the end of Job. We're going to kind of tie all this together. But I am going to give you just one example out of this. and I'm, I'm going to tie all the others together. But go to 2 Kings 20. And, and we see that God also will, will remove life, but he can also extend life. It just depends on, you know, the heart of... God knows your heart. God knows what, what, what's deep down inside. And in 2 Kings 20, we see the story of Hezekiah. And in verse 1 it says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass afore Isaiah was gone out in the middle of the court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of, of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and will defend this city for my own sake and for my servants David's sake. Now what's interesting here is that God is extending his life of a prayer, but he's doing it for a much bigger purpose than just Hezekiah's life. He says there, I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And if we were to read that whole story, unfortunately, Hezekiah didn't uh, appreciate this the way that, uh, that someone should have appreciated because he got a little bit too, too uh, presumptuous. That later on, if you know the story, he shows off it, basically his whole kingdom. And Isaiah comes back and says, what have you done? He says, well, I showed him everything. And he's like, because of that, you're going to lose it all. And then, you know, that was the, the, you know, the only solace that he had was that he, his life was extended another 15 years. That he would have peace in his life. But what ended up happening because of his arrogance was his family, his generations wouldn't have peace. So, I, I, and that's not the purpose of the story, but we've got to have a right attitude towards what God adds. You know, he prayed fervently and God adds, well, if he gives you that time, give it back to the Lord in servitude. Right? If you have those extra years, give it to the Lord of servitude. We don't, there is no lease on life. You know, this reminds me of the story of, uh, I have a, my, my uh, missionary friend in, in Korea. Well, when we were running a, a broker dealer together, we raised money and we filmed a couple of movies. And one of the movies that we filmed was with a, a famous uh, celebrity, a comedian by the name of Chris Kattan. Whether you heard of him or not, it, it, it's really irrelevant. But in that movie, he was co-starring with his dad, who was Kip King. Now, some of you might know Kip King because he's from an older generation. Kip King was like in his 80s, during, uh, this is about 10 years ago, and he started in show business back in like the 30s and 40s. Well, while he was on set, he, uh, the, our, our uh, investment firm was the one that was producing the film, so my friend, uh, my mentor in business and friend, he was over there producing the film. And he's, he was a missionary, a, bit, a, mis, a Baptist missionary kid growing up in Mexico. So, you know, he's given the gospel to people. And he, he's talking to these celebrities about Christ. He's like, look, Chris, if you die, you're 100% sure you go to hell. I mean, go to heaven, not hell. Sorry about that. And then um, in one of those instances, he actually gave the gospel to Kip King. What well, didn't take or anything. Shortly after the film was actually produced and done, which, by the way, it's just a beam film. That's why I'm going to – it never made it. It just – it was one of those films. I didn't realize how many films get made that never make it, but 
that's a story for another day. But there's a voicemail I have, and I, I, it only came to me now. I did, when I was typing the sermon, I wasn't thinking of it. But I'll bring it one day, and the voicemail is Kip King calling William. And he says, William, please come. You know, he couldn't talk because he's at the hospital. He's on a, uh, he's actually on a ventilator. He's having a hard time speaking. He's just trying to get the words out. So it sounds very robotic. He's like, William, please come. You know, I, I, I'm going to die. I want to take Jesus into my life. I need help. Just come. And that was the message. I mean, it's a very desperate message. Obviously, not every salvation message is like that, but he's very, you know, he's on his deathbed. They, they had only given him a couple of days to live. So he got on a plane, went to Los Angeles, went to the hospital, led him to the Lord. And then what happened was, miraculously, he got better. Now, it was only for about a month, but he, he was able to, the doctors couldn't explain it, but he just had this great health. Now, he didn't, I mean, what I mean is, in the context of his sickness, he, he didn't leave the hospital and was like running around, but he just got a lot better. Have you ever seen that where someone's in the hospital and they're really sick, they're on the death bed, all of a sudden something happens and they're just a little bit better for a few days and then eventually they just pass away? Well, he got saved and for like about a month he got to spend time with his children and his grandchildren and just they came to the hospital and he, he was able to, you know, vividly enjoy them. And then after that, he, the disease took over. I mean, it wasn't, it was inevitable and he passed away. But here's the great thing. Regardless, he was going to pass away anyways. That was the, that's a sure thing. But now he's been in heaven for that many years. This was back maybe like in 2009, 2008. So for the last 11 years, Kip King has been in heaven enjoying the glory of God for that long. So we don't know what God's going to add. But the one thing he did add was eternal life. You know, Hezekiah here gets 15 more years, but unfortunately his attitude about it didn't end up that well. Go to Job. Uh, go back to Job 42 as we run this out. Go back to Job 42, and we see that God will add to your life too. I mean, we just have to do His glory. His, you know, what's the purpose uh, of our lives? What's the purpose of the Bible? What's the purpose of everything? I mean, bottom line is to worship the Lord, right? I mean, we could say the bottom line is to get saved, but obviously, if you're getting saved, it's because there's a worship to the Almighty. You recognize. His glory and His power and His majesty. You know, God didn't create the world so that someone could come up with a theory of evolution to explain why things happen. No, He created the world in His vastness so that we could see His glory and His dominion. It's not for us to understand. It's for us to be in awe of His majesty. You know, you go there to Job 42. This is after everything. It says, And the Lord turned, verse 10, it says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when He prayed for His friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him, all, comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she asses. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapak. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this lived Job in 140 years, and he saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job. Job died being old and full of days. And so we see that he went through this whole thing. And what's interesting there in verse 11 it says, And comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. You know, it's important to understand that God doesn't answer to us. And God doesn't care what we think. God's not a respecter of persons. God set up, you know, our lives to worship Him and to be saved by Jesus Christ. Right there it says, in all the evil, people say, well, the Lord would never do that. Well, He's saying here that He's, it says, all the evil that the Lord had brought upon Him. So why are you sick? Well, it could be because that's just our nature. As humans, we're, we're in a state of, of, uh, of corruption. We're just going to get sick. We're appointed to die once. Why are you sick? It could just be that God hath brought this evil upon you for a purpose that you don't know. 
You know, I mean, I mean or why are you sick? Well, it could be that you're, you're hardened and God's now punishing you for that. We, we, we don't, you know, let's not play that game. The one thing that you can do is you can be sure that if you're serving the Lord and you're following his will, then maybe it's for a purpose that's bigger than what you think. You know, don't, I'm not saying that we're not going to play here, like we're not going to play this game where we're going to try to figure out what God is, but it, it, it's a lot easier to say, well, this guy, you know, he, he saved and he's trying to serve the Lord. And he's doing these things. He's sick. Let's pray that the Lord's will be done, that others would benefit from whatever is coming from that. I, obviously, if somebody calls me that's lost in the world and, you know, they're just living this wicked lifestyle, I don't think that that's going to serve as much purpose as someone who's serving the Lord. I mean, that's evident by the, the verses I'm showing here. I mean, the only, the only positive that comes out of Pharaoh's story is that Moses was faithful, right? And what, what's the other thing? That the people were obedient and they put the blood, you know, we see the foreshadowing, they put the blood on the post so that the, the, the destroyer wouldn't destroy them, right? But that's the story, but we don't know. Who, so the idea here is that God's the one that adds and God's the one that's going to remove. Go back, uh, you know, I got these this morning, but go to James. Actually, well, well, I'll just read for you, James. And uh, if you guys would just go to uh, 2 Kings, go back to 2 Kings 5. Go to back to 2 Kings 5. Let me just turn here to James while you guys go to 2 Kings. You guys are going back to 2 Kings. And so James 5, verse uh, 10 and 11 says, Take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. And I've seen the end of the Lord, and the Lord is very pitiful, end of a tender mercy. So in the same vein that he's the one that brought the evil upon Job, he was also very pitiful, end of tender mercy. You know, people say, well, how can God be a terrible God and a merciful God? Because he's God. How can God love something and hate something? Because he's God. I mean, it's his word. In the, I mean, I guess, you know, if, if I had time, we could make ser do sermons on that, and I could go into deep explanation. But if you don't have time to explain something, like in this sermon, the bottom line is, I mean, honestly, we don't even really, it's, it's up to you to believe in God. It's not for God to prove himself to you. It's not God's duty to come over here and be like, well, you know, the reason I wrote the Bible is because I wanted you to understand this, and, you know, I hope we're friends, and, and I hope that this makes sense to you. Is that okay? He's not getting your opinion on things. He's just saying, this is my word. This is the way things are. You know, God creates everything for, for a purpose. Go back to 2 Kings 5.20. You know, going back to the story of Naaman, you know, the, the leper gets healed. Naaman's trying to, to, to give Elijah some money for this, and Elijah rejects it. Why does he reject it? Because Elijah, I'm sorry, Elijah, I was, it's Elijah. He uh, ultimately, he knows where that power emanated from. He was just the conduit. You know, if he would have taken it, it's like taking credit for something that, that you didn't do. It's like, uh, you know, if people say, well, you know, what about that Spring Crest uh, Baptist Church? Oh, yeah, I, I, I built that church. You know, that, that'd be like taking credit for something I didn't do. This church has been around for 40 years. You know, I serve here, and we do, we do great things, and I've been here for several years, but this church has been around way before I was even uh, a thought. You know, this, this church, is, I'm going to be 40 years old. This church has been around way longer than 40 years. So what I'm saying is Elijah knows that he's not the one to take credit. But what happens? Elijah didn't, but then other people uh, come in and do that. And he will also add the negative. Right here in verse 20 says, But Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared name in the, the Syrian. So he's giving credit to the wrong, the, the wrong individual. In not receiving at his hands that which he uh, brought, but as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master hath sent me. Now he's lying, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me, uh, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of, uh, the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two charges of garment. And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in, in uh, two bags. So Naaman's, you know, extremely grateful with two charges of garments and laid them upon uh, two of his servants and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them 
from their hand and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elijah said unto him, Whence thou comest, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went not whither. And he said unto him, Went not my heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it time to receive money and receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. The challenge is, it's the, the attitude that you take towards the things that God does in people's life. You know, Gehazi sees this great work, this healing, and he, he, he looks like one of those congregants that's throwing himself on the ground when Benny Hinn tells you to throw yourself on the ground after he puts his hand on you. You know, they're giving the credit to Benny Hinn, you know, to this fake faith healer. Gehazi's like, hey, this, and then he takes the credit, he goes around lying everywhere, and what happens? God adds the leprosy to him, you know, through Elijah. So we've got to be careful when we're, we're dealing with, and I didn't mean to, I, I meant to preach it about health, but I didn't mean to, this is just an application for life. We've got to be careful with the way we deal with God when we're coming to him with our requests and petitions. Our requests and our petitions are always that his will be done in our life and for us to serve him and for us to do his will. Because then what happens is then we will get the proper, you know, uh, not only response and reward or blessing, but then we'll also, when it doesn't seem like that was the, the, the reward or response or blessing we should have gotten, we'll know that that's really our flesh speaking and not what God's doing in our life. Because that's the thing, is it's hard to understand what God does in our life. Remember, the Bible says he gives the increase. Then John the Baptist says, I must decrease, that he must increase. And so there's times where we do things and the cause is one thing and the effect is another. And when the effect comes, we're just like, man, that, that, that wasn't what I expected. It, it really wasn't what I thought it was going to be. But if we have the right frame of mind, we go back to the word of God. We're like, you know what? That's just the way God he wants us to be content in whatever state we're in. Go over there to the Matthew, and we'll start closing this thing out. Go there, go there to Matthew 8. And I just wanted to you know, give you a couple more examples. Who is the great physician? Jesus. God is. You know, as, as these individuals and other members of our church are, are going to go face these challenges, you know, it's for us to be there for them and support them and to encourage them in the Word of God. Number one... It's my prayer that Brother Bobby comes, comes out of his surgery great because Brother Bobby has a ministry in the AA. He's been sober for a long time, and he brings a lot of people to church. And through that ministry, we've led a lot of people to church. This year, we've baptized two recovering uh, drug addicts who first believed on the Lord, of course. I, I, you got to make that clear because people we don't want to confuse anybody nowadays. You know, everybody's confused about everything, but they believed on the Lord, and then we baptized them. That's a great thing. You know, uh, we want the Lord to deliver Brother Tommy, if possible, because he brings people to church. We want Brother Lord, to, the Lord to uh, deliver Brother James, because he's our faithful soul winner. You know, things like. But I'd rather His will be done. You know, if, if that's not the case, then that He give us the understanding not only for those that are going through it, but for us that are are going through it with them, that we understand why things happen. And that, that we see where the where his purpose is leading, the expected end. You know, he's given us that expected. Go to Matthew 8, verse 1. It says, When he was come down from the mountain, great multitude followed him. And behold, there came a leopard and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleaned. And Jesus said, saith unto him, See thou, tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. And when Jesus went, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he do, doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham, 
and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and ministered unto him. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick, that it might, that it might be fulfilled was, uh, which was spoken by his eyes, the prophet saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness. And here we have several examples of the way that God, Jesus heals. You know, we see the leper here. We see the great faith of the centurion. You know, then we see him just, you know, healing Peter's uh, mother-in-law. We see then many are bought. And he's, so we know Jesus can do anything. And it, what's interesting is, is I was preparing this. I didn't call Pastor Cobb. But I didn't know he was going to be preaching, you know, a similar subject on these type of verses. We could have used these verses today for the sermon that he preached this morning. You know, that's the great thing about the Bible. There's just so many examples. But the thing that, that, that holds true is, what is it? It's the faith and the belief. Right? I mean, at the end of the day, people are sick regardless. But if you don't have that belief in the eternal uh, blood of Jesus Christ, then you're not going to have that eternity in the afterlife, as, as people refer to it, right? I mean, there's, which I find condescending, but there's runs for cancer, and there's runs for, you know, AIDS, and there's runs for that, and they don't accomplish diddly squat. But, you know, for us, if we go out there and we run and knock on people's doors and give them the gospel of Jesus Christ, I might not heal anybody of cancer. And I might not heal anybody of AIDS physically, but eternally we're going to heal them for all eternity, right? And so we've got to focus on what God adds and what God removes and who is the author and the finisher, not only of our faith, but of our life. I'm going to close out with this, and, 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 uh, and we're done right there in Psalms. And I... I if, if the lesson doesn't have to, if, 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 it, if it's at all possible, I, I enjoy, me personally, I enjoy closing out with a psalm. I don't know, the psalms just, they resonate, you know. You got to just think about David and all the things that he went through. I mean, he wrote these things in like, in great emotional distress. Some good, some bad. You know, and the psalms are just these great words of these, these great poems of just, speaking out to the Lord and His majesty and just seeing the greatness that He does in our life. And if you look there at Psalm 103, I'm not going to read the whole thing. The first two verses we see, a psalm of David, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. So he's asking to bless the soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all my diseases, you know, the more you read the Bible, you realize that David here is not talking about the physical. He knows what he's, he's dealing with is the eternal. And we know this, because, and I reference this quite a bit, because for me it's just one of the great, you know, I guess people just fixate on different things in the Bible. For me, I just love when Jesus says, even David called me Lord. Because we know who David is talking about. David's talking about Jesus. You know, he knows that's part of the lineage right there in Psalm, and then verse 22 says, Bless the Lord. All his works in all places of his dominion, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. So in the same psalm where he knows that he's being forgiven of his iniquities and he's being healed of all his diseases, what's the ultimate thing that David does? He's blessing the Lord. It's all for the glory of God. Whether we're going to go into surgery tomorrow or whether we're going to continue you know, in our lives in the mundane day-to-day -day thing that we got to do, doing the ordinary things, hopefully extraordinary well. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, if we're blessing the Lord, we have the great gift. But, you know, people don't get to bless the Lord, at least not in this context, unless they're saved. Now, there's false prophets out there. I mean, Judas was with Christ. Judas gave the gospel. Talk about scary. Jesus sent them out two by two. Judas was knocking on doors, asking if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you'd be going to hell? I mean, uh, heaven, I don't know why I keep saying hell. I, uh, well, it doesn't matter. Are you 100% sure? If you're 100% sure you're going to hell, we need to fix that. And we're going to turn it around and make it 100% sure you're going to heaven. 
But what's interesting is that I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure that they had a different variation of that gospel message. But they had the gospel message, and Judas is out there knocking that door. You know, and and but he's not praising Jesus Christ. He's praising his works. He's like, look at me. But David, we know, is a man after God's own heart, and he's going through it. And he is, I mean, he is, he, he, he commits adultery in his life, and he commits murder, and, you know, he does all, you know, great works for the Lord, but he also does, you know, horrible things. And even later in his life, you know, I love the way the pastor preaches it, when he's old and frail and they bring the mains to him, he doesn't know them. He doesn't commit the same mistakes. And at the end, he's writing all this, and he's saying, it doesn't matter I'm going to bless the Lord. You know, God Almighty, you're the one. You're the reason that we go through the good and we go through the bad. You're the reason that any of this happens. You know, and I'd rather it be his reason than no reason at all. I know a couple of weeks ago I preached about humility and pride. And I would much rather learn to be humble before the Lord than to be humbled by the Lord. Now, as humans, we probably will be humble at some point because that's just, you know, our human nature. But I would much rather learn to work towards that. So I hope that this was helpful, you know, that it doesn't matter what our health is here on this earth. Now, try to take care of yourself. You know what I mean? You can do a lot more for the Lord if you take care of yourself. But if you don't, you have an eternal soul and, it's, and, it's, uh, and, and you're, you're saved by grace through Jesus Christ. And it's all by faith. Then at the end of the day, I mean, at least you're getting into heaven. The last shall be first and the first shall be last, you know. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord. Thank you so much for the opportunity to just uh, preach this message. Thank you, Lord, for uh, laying it in my heart. Lord, thank you for showing us that it's you who, who are the beginning in our life, who are the end. You're the one who adds. You're the one who removes. You know, sometimes we, we just get so caught up in, in the results of whatever we're doing, whether it's an exercise program or a dietary program or a soul winning program or a Bible study program, but if but you know our hearts, and if we're doing it for the wrong reasons, then you're going to remove those, those blessings. We're doing it for the right. We're going to get those blessings, and sometimes they come in the form of trials and tribulations and persecution. And, you know, the world will hate us because it hated you first. But if we have the right context, if we have your word constantly in our mind, renewing us daily, then we know that we can face any obstacle and any challenge. And the only thing that we should fear is God, uh, you, Lord, God yourself, uh, you know, because... Satan can't do anything to us. The world can't do anything to us. Even if they take our life, they can't take our eternal life, our spiritual life. So thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.